very pleasant task of uh, lecturing on Sayre's conjecture. So Sayre's conjecture is a conjecture about uh, Galois representations, and it concerns representations of the Galois group of Q into finite groups, <coughs> homomorphisms into finite groups of the form the GLE 2 of E, where E is a finite field, or you could write that as GL 2 of Q, where Q is the order of E. And uh, with some mild hypotheses on these representations, it, it, it uh, proposes to parametrize them completely. <coughs> it's a fundamental problem in non-abelian uh, extensions of the rationals. In some sense, it's completely untouched. Uh, so uh, it's a good problem to work on. And uh, Sayre's idea is to parametrize these homomorphisms using modular forms mod p, where q is a, q is a power of a prime. <coughs> So to tell you about his parameterization of these, I have to do a little bit of the theory of modular forms mod p, which is a beautiful subject in its own right. And to do modular forms mod p, I have to do modular forms over the complex numbers. So I'll start with that. So a modular form over the complex numbers of weight k, which is an integer <coughs> greater and equal to 0, for the group gamma 1 of n, which is a congruent subgroup of SL2z, which I think you've seen before is a function on the upper half plane that transforms in a certain way under gamma 1 of n. <coughs> uh, however, it's convenient to think of it in terms of elliptic curves. Whoops. So in terms of elliptic curves, <coughs> it's a law, a, fun a modular form. So this would be an f of tau on the upper half plane. So f gives a law on complex elliptic curves, <coughs> which takes a complex elliptic curve with a little bit of level n structure, which I'll specify and gives you an element in a one-dimensional vector space associated to that elliptic curve. So <clears throat> it's going to be a rule that takes an elliptic curve, E over C, <clears throat> and <clears throat> the level N structure is going to be, for me, a homomorphism from the group scheme of N, div n fruits of unity into the N torsion on the elliptic curve. John Tate discussed finite group schemes <clears throat> uh, yesterday, so it's going to be a a map from the group scheme of nth roots of unity to the nth torsion. Now, of course, over the complex numbers, this is the same as uh, you can choose an nth root of unity, and that's the same as the group scheme z mod n. Some people like to use z mod n, but I prefer this for reasons I'll show you. And it's a law that takes f of e alpha to an element in the one-dimensional vector space where you take the invariant differentials on e, <coughs> invariant or holomorphic differentials, That's a one-dimensional space over the complex number. It doesn't have a natural basis, so you don't want to identify with the complex numbers. And you take it, it should take values in the kth, exterior, kth tensor power of that vector space. So how do we get such a law, canonical law, from, from a modular form? Well, we write our elliptic curve. E over the complex numbers can always be written as the quotient of the complex numbers by a lattice. So I'll take my lattice to be 2 pi i times z plus z tau. Namely, by scaling, I can make one of the vectors in the lattice 2 pi i z. Sorry, I have a little trouble with this board. There we go. <clears throat> and the reason I do this is that if you use the exponential map, you can also write this in, in Tate's form of c star modulo q to the z, where q is e to the 2 pi i tau. The exponential map kills half of the lattice, this 2 pi i z part. <clears throat> And if you do that, you see that this elliptic curve, if you write it in this way, has a canonical level n structure because inside of C star, you have the nth roots of unity. So the alpha will be the map that's induced by putting nth roots of unity into C star and then mapping to C star mod q to the z. So that's our, once we've written the elliptic curve this way, it has a level n structure. <coughs> and it also, if you write it in this way, has a basis for the differentials of the first kind, omega e, namely just given by the dz, uh, where, where, where z is the complex parameter on the tangent space, so uh, <coughs> dz to the k is a basis for omega e tensor to the k. And this modular form, which is a function on the upper half plane, you view it as a function of that variable, and you take the law that takes f of e alpha to <coughs> this complex number, f of tau times zd tensor to the k, and that's an element in this space. <coughs> and you check 
that that does not depend on our particular representation of E. Namely, you can scale the lattice and you can change the basis with, a, with an A tau plus B or a C tau plus D. And the fact that this transforms like a modular form of, of weight K for uh, gamma 1 of N means that this is a well-defined element in the uh, kth tensor power. So this is a way of rethinking modular forms in terms of these uh, <laughs> laws. And uh, Deline had the wonderful idea that said, uh, well, if you <coughs> want to do holomorphic modular forms, it's not enough to have a holomorphic function on the upper half plane, namely a function on all elliptic curves. But uh, you need some behavior of that function as you tend towards the boundary of the upper half plane. You don't want it to, you want it to be holomorphic at the cusps also. And uh, Deline's interpretation of that was to study uh, such laws not just on elliptic curves, but on so-called generalized elliptic curves. So uh, Deline extend for, for a holomorphic modular form. This would be a meromorphic one. You want the law to extend to generalized curves. Generalized, generalized E. So those are curves <coughs> over C algebras that perhaps have multiplicative reduction at some places. Uh, curves like Tate's elliptic curve. And uh, if, it general, if it extends to generalized elliptic curves, then you have a holomorphic modular form. You have this, you have notion of a level n structure in a generalized elliptic curve. It's a little bit complicated. You also have the notion of this invariant differential space, so you can talk about the law. Now, K or K? no, this is of weight k. So the differentials weight two. Okay. K is equal to two as the differentials. This is, not, this is not the differentials on the modular curve. This is, there, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a map uh, called the Kadira Spencer map, which takes such a law, which is a section of, uh, which gives elements in WE tensor 2, takes it to, holomor to, takes it to differentials on the modular curve, which if you have a cusp form, gives you a holomorphic differential. Okay? In any case, uh, this, this extension to generalized elliptic curves allows you to define algebraically the notion of a Q expansion of a modular form, which is very valuable. <coughs> this is Deline's interpretation of Q expansions, which previously were just rewriting the modular form and saying that F of tau was F of tau plus 1, so it could be expanded in terms of Q. Well, here the algebraic notion is to consider the Tate elliptic curve, GM mod Q to the Z, over the base, C double brackets Q, <clears throat> and uh, that has a canonical uh, uh, mu n in it, given by the inclusion of uh, mu n in GM. That's the reason why I prefer using a mu n as opposed to a z mod n for the level structure, because GM canonically contains mu n and not z mod n. And uh, so that has a natural level structure. And it's a generalized elliptic curve, namely at q equals 0, it has multiplicative reduction. And uh, it not only does it have a canonical level n structure, but it has a natural basis for the invariant differentials. Namely, you take the basis for invariant differentials on GM, so that's called dt over t. And if you take that to the tensor k power, it's the basis of the invariant differentials on the Tate curve. And consequently, if we have a modular form, we can apply it to the Tate curve over this base. And it gives us <coughs> an element of this over this ring. And so we can write f of e alpha as an element of this ring. So that would be its q expansion, a n q to the n, times dt over t tensor k. And this expansion of f is called the q expansion at the cusp infinity. There are other cusps of the modular curve gamma 1 of n, and you have to use different models of the Tate curve, but this is the q expansion at infinity. Yes? Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> Be delighted. So this is, so these are complex numbers, and uh, and if uh, so, the value on the, the the value on the Tate curve at the point q equals zero would be the constant coefficient a zero, and if that value is zero at all generalized elliptic curves, namely, not only does the law extend to generalized elliptic curves, but it vanishes on all generalized elliptic curves, which have bad reduction, then you call the form a cusp form. So these forms form a vector space. Let me say that.
So we let MK be the space of, whoops, too much. Let's come down, come down, come down. Stop. Sorry, I'm just learning. Bonk. Good. MK, we let to be the vector space, complex vector space of <coughs> holomorphic forms of weight K for gamma 1 of n. Now, <coughs> that's just the abstract definition, the laws of this sort. But uh, as uh, Edix, uh, <coughs> sorry, my, I'm thinking, uh, as Yaptop said to you, uh, you can sometimes identify this with a more familiar vector space. If, you're, if your level n is greater than 4, then it turns out that the problem of classifying elliptic curves with this cyclic type of subgroup, with this point of order n, turns out to be a rigid problem, has no automorphisms, even for generalized elliptic curves. And so there's a universal elliptic curve with this, or universal generalized elliptic curve, universal generalized E over the curve that's sometimes called x1 of n. And its invariant differentials, omega, give a line bundle on this curve, projective module of rank 1, and its kth tensor power also gives a line bundle on this curve. And so if you have a modular form of weight k on gamma 1 of n, and you apply it to this universal curve, what you get is a section of that line bundle over this curve. So you can identify mk as isomorphic to the sections over the universal curve of this line bundle. Maybe I'll call it omega e tensor k. And um, one can compute the degree of this line bundle because there's a comparison between omega tensor 2 there's a famous theorem, of, which is essentially the kadira spencer deformation theory is isomorphic to the canonical bundle of the modular curve with poles at the cusps, the, the degenerations. That allows you to compute the degree of this bundle from the genus of this curve and the number of cusps. And you see that for all k greater than or equal to 2, the degree of uh, omega e tensor k is greater than or equal to 2g, <coughs> I think minus 1 or plus 1, I don't know, plus or minus 1. In any case, you can compute the number of sections, the dimension of this space from the riemann roch formula. The only mysterious weight in some sense is weight 1, where the line bundle has degree approximately g minus 1, it's close to being a theta characteristic. And there, the riemann roch formula tells you almost nothing about the number of sections, and you don't know how large this space is. But in, in general, you can compute the dimension, and uh, so you get this finite dimensional vector space. Good. Now, uh, the Q expansion gives an injection, it turns out, of MK into the ring of power series in Q, and in fact gives a direct sum, gives an injection. of the graded ring of mk, q expansion at infinity, into this ring, C double bracket q. So this is a nice graded ring, z graded. And uh, one proves a number of things about this ring, or this subring of q expansions. For example, it's a, <coughs> it's a Kroll dimension 2 ring. It's proj, uh, get when you have uh, this, its proj is always d defines the uh, modular curve x1 of n. <coughs> if, for example, if n is equal to 1, if I call this ring m maybe, for n equal 1, which is a famous case, uh, the ring m is, is generated over the complex numbers by a modular form of weight 4 called E4 and a modular form of weight 6. Polynomial ring and two variables. <coughs> okay, now. Uh, an important fact about this complex vector space, which we're going to use when we look at modular forms mod p, is it has a number of canonical endomorphisms called the Heck operators. And they can be defined using this, uh, this, this perspective of laws <coughs> as follows. So if we have a prime L that does not divide n, let me define the Heck operators for you. 
And then we'll get to modular forms mod p. So if I take a prime L that does not divide n, I have an endomorphism of mk which goes as follows. <coughs> f slash tl. So that's going to be a new law on, this, on the set of elliptic curves and level n structures. So I have to tell you <coughs> what it assigns to E alpha. <coughs> so this is defined as follows. You take 1 over L. That's no problem because we're over the complex numbers. The sum over the L plus 1 isogenies of degree L with source E. So that's a map phi from E to some curve E prime, <clears throat> another elliptic curve. So you divide out by the, the L plus 1 cyclic subgroups of order L on E. Now, since L is prime to N, this injection that we had from alpha N into E, if you compose it with this isogeny, it's still an injection because the kernel of this has order L and this has order N, which is prime to L. So on, uh, we get new elliptic curves and new level structures, maybe we'll call those alpha prime. So we can certainly evaluate F at E prime and alpha prime. And where, what do we get? We get an element in the kth tensor power of the uh, invariant differentials on E prime. So this is in. And then you pull it back via the isogeny phi to get an element in the kth tensor power of the uh, invariant differentials on E, and that's exactly what you're supposed to assign to that. So this would be a definition of TL, and for L dividing N, there's an operator called UL, which has degree L, and you do exactly the same thing, except you only sum over the L isogenies with source E, such that the kernel <coughs> does not intersect this alpha N, such that when you compose, you still get an injection of alpha N into E prime. So this is same but assume kernel of phi intersect the image of alpha n is equal to 0. So that's something of degree uh, L instead of L plus 1. And finally, there are automorphisms of the space. So these give endomorphisms, linear endomorphisms. And finally, there's an automorphism of the space for every uh, class in Z mod n star. It's sometimes called diamond D, I don't know why. So this D is in Z mod N star, an invertible element. And that just changes the level structure, namely this applied to E alpha is defined to be F of E D alpha, where this just means multiply the map by D. That makes sense because this has this cyclic of order N. So that's an automorphism of the curve. And these endomorphisms of this space, you easily check, all commute with each other. So they generate a commutative algebra of endomorphisms of this finite dimensional space. And over the complex numbers, in fact, you even have an inner product on this space called a Hermitian inner product called the Paterson inner product for which uh, these endomorphisms are uh, at least they're, they're normal endomorphisms. So uh, there's a theory of diagonalization, but I'm not going to talk about that. Now I want to talk about modular forms mod p. Let me see if I can get this board where I want it. Put this up here, take this down here. Oh, this is going to be tough. Stop that. Whoops, a little higher. Stop it. Now, take this up. This is going to be hard, I can see. Oh, well. We'll go with that. All right, now, this, 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 the procedure of making an algebraic definition of a modular form is nice because it works not only C over C, definition of modular forms, works whenever, in fact, over the ring Z where you invert N. Namely, it works whenever N is invertible, whenever N is invertible. The problem with n not being invertible is that uh, you might have a problem that there are no embeddings of mu n into the n torsion of an elliptic curve. For example, if you have a super singular elliptic curve, you cannot map mu p into the p division points. It's not just not, not a, no, no way of injecting it. 
However, if we assume n is invertible, then the n torsion on an elliptic curve is what's called an etal uh, group scheme, and it, you, can, you can embed mu n. And in particular, this definition works perfectly well over fields, <coughs> over fields of characteristic p greater than 0, providing that p is prime to n, the level. So if n is equal to 1, it works for all primes p. Namely, you just study laws on elliptic curves <coughs> over that field that, uh, that behave in this way. And uh, in terms of this sections of this vector bundle on the curve, maybe I should come down with that a little bit. Whoops. Stop. Let's come down here. Where this definition of mk is defined as the sections of a, a vector bundle. Uh, you just prove that the modular curve x1 of n can be, in fact, defined over fields of characteristic p, where p does not divide n, and you just take the space of such sections. And that shows you that modular forms mod p are, in some sense, reductions of modular forms in characteristic 0, provided the weight is at least 2, because <clears throat> the dimension of this space is somehow independent of the characteristic. It's given by the riemann roch theorem just in terms of the genus of the curve. However, that's only in the case where the weight is large enough so that the degree of the line bundle is large enough. In weight 1, you can have the bizarre phenomenon of having no modular forms in characteristic 0, but for a finite number of primes p, having some modular forms of weight 1 in characteristic p. That, that's just the phenomenon of line bundles on curves which, which have small degree. For all sufficiently large primes p, the number of sections will be the same as in characteristic 0. But one of the, one of the nice things about Sayre's conjecture is that it, it explains the extra modular forms of weight 1 that appear in characteristic p. OK. Now, another nice thing about modular forms in characteristic p is that there are a couple of canonical ones, which are not true over the complex numbers. For example, there's a very famous form that changes the whole aspects of the theory called the Hasse invariant. So we're now in a field of characteristic P. So there's a canonical modular form A, Hasse invariant. Somehow the only canonical modular form in, in, over complex numbers is the constant one. But the Hasse invariant has, it has level n equal 1, so any level really, <clears throat> and it has weight k equal p minus 1. <clears throat> and I'll define it for you now. So it's going to be a law on elliptic curves, taking values in a certain power of the differentials. So <clears throat> we take our elliptic curve in characteristic p, it's, it's sitting there, and we choose a local parameter at the origin. At the origin of e. And then, as Joe Silverman no doubt told you, uh, we have the formal group associated to that parameter, <clears throat> and we can study multiplication by p in that formal group, and we write it out. So this is multiplication by p. Now that always starts p times z, but in characteristic p, p is 0. So the, 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 the linear term of it is 0, and it's a theorem that multiplication by p is always a power series in x to the p. So uh, the first term is, is of the form a, z to the p, plus higher terms. Always looks like that in characteristic p. <clears throat> On the other hand, if we also choose our local parameter, this a depends on the choice of local parameter at the origin. On the other hand, the choice of a local parameter also gives us a basis. Maybe I'll write it dz, so we, well, no, that's bad notation. A basis for the invariant differentials that begins 1 plus dz, namely, the, different, the invariant differentials form a one-dimensional space, and choosing a local parameter at the origin is the same as fixing a basis, or, or it gives a basis of that space that starts off with dz. And consequently, <clears throat> we define uh, f of e, we don't need any level structure because n is equal to 1, to be the element a times omega tensor p minus 1 in omega e tensor p minus 1. And you check that this is independent of z. So it depends only on the elliptic curve, and that's the Hasse invariant. Sorry, that's called A. And it can vanish. In particular, it vanishes exactly on the set of what are called supersingular elliptic curves, where multiplication by p is an inseparable isogeny of degree p squared, and so this coefficient vanishes in the formal group. So vanishes. 
on super singular E. But what's even more amazing about it somehow or another is that when you calculate it on the Tate curve, which you can do, uh, you find that the formal group is so closely related to the multiplicative group <coughs> that the Haas invariant of the Tate curve as a power, so you know, it always gives some Fourier expansion, right? It turns out to be 1 times dt over t to the p minus 1. Namely, its q expansion is just identically 1. That's a bizarre thing because in Characteristic zero, you can tell what a modular form is from its Q expansion. The Q expansion injects the whole ring of modular forms, so it doesn't confuse the constant modular form one with a modular form of weight P minus one. In characteristic P, Q expansions inject each space MK, but they can confuse different values of K. And so here you have a modular form of weight P minus one having the same Q expansion as the constant modular form one. And consequently, if you study the map of M, which is the direct sum of MK, into uh, the power series over z mod pz, let's work over the prime field, why not? Q, given by the Q expansion, it's not an injection. And it turns out that the kernel of the map is equal to the principal ideal. This is a theorem of Sayre and Swinnerton Dyer. A minus 1 times m. Certainly that's in the kernel. A goes to the same thing as 1. <coughs> And consequently, you get a beautiful quotient ring, the image of the modular forms in Q expansion. This is still a Kroll algebra of dimension 2, just like it was in characteristic 0. But if you take its image in this ring, you get an algebra of dimension 1. Namely, it turns out to be the algebra of functions on an affine curve. So if we take the quotient, m tilde, which is m mod a minus 1m, that has dimension 1. <coughs> and it can be identified <coughs> with the affine coordinate ring, it's no, lo sorry, it's no longer graded, of course, because we've divided by a non-homogeneous ideal. A has degree p minus 1 and 1 has degree 0. So it's no longer z graded, it's graded by z mod p minus 1z. And <clears throat> it turns out to be an affine coordinate ring, I'll say that now, coordinate ring of the so-called Igusa curve. I'll write I1 of n, maybe I'll <coughs> minus the super singular points, which turns out to be an atoll cover in characteristic P of X1 of n minus the super singular points, where the Galois group is Z mod P star. <coughs> and so this is a curve minus a certain number of points. I'll describe it to you in a moment. And this group acts on it. Consequently, the ring of affine functions, which is one-dimensional algebra over Z mod P, has an action of this group and is graded by the different powers of the Teichmuller character. And the uh, Agusa curve can be described in a lot of ways as a moduli problem. It only exists in characteristic P. It's a new phenomenon, just like this Hasse invariant only exists in characteristic P. And uh, the, the ne neatest way to describe it, people like to say, well, it's a Kummer covering of this curve because we're in characteristic P, so we have P minus first roots of unity, so any covering should be taken by a P minus first root of something. And people like to say, well, you get it as the P minus first root of the Hasse invariant. See, the Hasse invariant is non-zero on X1 minus the super singular points. It only vanishes on the super singular. But the Hasse invariant isn't a function on this curve. It's a section of a line bundle. And what happens is that if you pull back the line bundle omega from X1 of n to this covering, then it has a natural section of itself. There exists a canonical section A in H0 of I of n omega E such that A to the P minus 1 is equal to A in the sections of omega to the P minus 1. So in some sense, you can get it as the P, P minus fir first root of the Haas invariant if you think of those as sections of line bundles. I won't describe that canonical section, but uh, it's a very useful thing to have when we do calculations later. Good. Down. Good. Maybe a little more.
are getting there. Stop. OK. And one more thing I have to tell you about modular forms mod p, and then I can state the main theorem about constructing Galois representations. And that's there's a nice derivation of the modular forms mod p that, again, does not exist in characteristic 0. It was studied by Swinnert and Dyer and Sayre. And it's, its construction is rather closely related to the Haas invariant and would take me a little too much time, but at least I can tell you what it does on the Fourier expansions. So also, in characteristic p greater than 0, there exists a derivation called theta, which maps the forms of weight k to the forms of weight k <coughs> plus p plus 1. Of course, multiplication by the Haas invariant is, a, is also an interesting map, which takes weight k to weight k plus p minus 1. And it takes a Fourier expansion, a n q to the n. I should say, things in, in weight k are determined by their Fourier expansion. That's because <coughs> The Fourier expansion gives you the section of the line bundle in a neighborhood of the point infinity. And the curve x1 of n turns out to be geometrically connected, so it's enough to know the formal expansion in the neighborhood of any point. So in weight k, it's determined by its Fourier expansion. And you take it to the Fourier expansion sum of n a n q to the n. Namely, you just differentiate and by it with respect to q and divide by q. So that there, you might call this dq over q. And then the theorem is that this is the Fourier expansion of something in weight k plus p plus 1. And the way you prove that is by a consideration of the gauss manin connection on the universal elliptic curve, which I won't do. OK, so those are two new things that appear in characteristic p. Now, another important theory that appears in characteristic p, I just have to put this up. Yes. Yes. Is the theory of the Hecke operators. Now, we define the Heck operators in characteristic 0 by that formula. And uh, that formula works perfectly well if you think about it in characteristic p, providing that L is not equal to p, because we've divided by L. So for all uh, L not equal to p, you have the Heck operators. Have the Hecke uh, UL, uh, TL. For, uh, for L dividing n, you have the UL. Of course, you have the bracket D. And the neat thing is that for k greater than or equal to 1, you can define the operator TP from mk to mk. You cannot define it for weight 0. If you think about it, for weight 0, you'd be summing over p plus 1 isogenies, the constant function, and then dividing by p. So you'd have the formula p plus 1 over p. So no way you're going to define that in characteristic p. It's the formula you know, 1 plus 1 over p. But for k greater than or equal to 1, it turns out that this definition miraculously works. Namely, what you do is you start with your modular form in characteristic p. And let's presume it has k greater than or equal to 2, just for simplicity. You lift it to characteristic 0. You apply the tp. And then you miraculously check that the, the Fourier coefficients of tp are still p integral. Even though you've divided by p, it cancels out. And then you reduce it mod p. However, it's much harder to define this in weight 1. It's quite a challenge to define this in weight 1 when you can't lift the characteristic 0. Nonetheless, it exists. So you have all these endomorphisms, but now of a finite dimensional vector space over z mod p. OK. So what we do is we try to simultaneously diagonalize these. So we say f in mk is a normalized eigenform. If. It's an eigenform for all of these operators, namely TL, F slash TL is AL times F for some. Uh, this is an eigenform, sorry, with coefficients in the finite field E over Z mod P. If <clears throat> it's an eigenform for TLs, an eigenform for the ULs, and it's an eigenform for the bracket operators, which, <clears throat> which means it's multiplied by a character of this group. And that character I'll call epsilon, where epsilon is a homomorphism from z mod n star into e star. And the ALs are in an e. And we normalize it. <clears throat> 
by requiring that its Fourier expansion have coefficient of q equal to 1. It turns out that once you have an eigenform for all the operators, that uh, <coughs> you, it's possible to normalize so that f is equal to the summation of a n q to the n for n greater than or equal to 0. It's possible to have a constant coefficient. But you insist that a1 is equal to 1, and then you find out that the eigenvalue for the heck operator, tl, on, uh, is in fact the coefficient of q to the l. And the eigenvalue for ul is in fact the coefficient of q to the l. <clears throat> so this is the normalization. So suppose we start with such an element in our space, mk. And we've had to go to some finite extension because this space can be defined over the field of p elements. We have all these commuting endomorphisms, but to diagonalize them, we'll have to go to some finite extension field. OK. <clears throat> now, Deligne's theorem is the following. No, no, stop. There we go. Let's try this one. Good. Damn. EP is included in the TLs. Once we've defined it, and we're always going to assume now that the weight is at least 1, because for weight 0, it's not such an interesting subject, the Galois representation. So the coefficient AP of this eigenform is the eigenvalue for TP, which could be 0. That's, this, that's the argument that the modular forms are the sections of a vector bundle on the curve. And when k is greater than or equal to 2, the degree of the vector bundle is at least 2g plus 1. Consequently, the, re the, the dimension of the space of sections is the same. And a general theorem of, of lifting sections tells you you can lift any section to it. So the, if, if, you, if you want to work with the original definition of modular forms mod p, which they are proposed, which just is reduction of q expansions from integral q expansions and characteristic 0, that works perfectly well for all weights k greater than or equal to 2. But this is, a, this is a theory that Katz and Deligne propose, which also has this intriguing element of weight 1. All right, so the Deligne's theorem is the following. Associated, <coughs> there exists a unique, semi-simple, and I'll say what I mean by that, Galois representation. This is associated to a normalized eigenform. So we fix a normalized eigenform. <coughs> Rho f from the Galois group of bar over q into GL2 of E, or really into the automorphisms of a two-dimensional vector space over this finite field E, <coughs> with the property that it's unramified for all primes L not dividing, n times p. n is the, is the, the, the gamma 1 of n. p is the characteristic that we're in, modular forms mod p. And, uh, and moreover, since it's unramified, the inertia group acts trivially. You can look at the image of a Frobenius element. And it doesn't quite tell you what the conjugacy class of the Frobenius element is, but it tells you what the characteristic polynomial is, namely what the conjugacy class of its semi-simple part is, and such that rho f of the Frobenius at L. And this is the, the usual Frobenius defined by Artin that modulo a prime dividing L raises to the Lth power, not its inverse, satisfies, <coughs> has characteristic polynomial, sorry, polynomial x squared minus Al times x, where this is the eigenvalue of the Heck operator, plus epsilon L times L to the k minus 1 where that's the weight. Of course, it only depends on what the weight is mod p minus 1, because this is in characteristic p. OK. Now, <clears throat> it's not difficult to prove. Semi-simple means direct sum of irreducible modules. So either this two-dimensional module is irreducible, which is the interesting case, or it's the direct sum of two lines. And you prove that if you have a semi-simple representation of, uh, of a global Galois group, then it's determined uniquely by the characteristic polynomials of Frobenius elements on a dense set of primes. And uh, 
since this is true for almost all primes, it's certainly a dense set of primes. So this, if this representation exists, this condition determines it uniquely. I want to emphasize that you still don't know what the, char what the conjugacy class of this is from this. For example, you might have the characteristic polynomial x squared <coughs> x minus 1 quantity squared. That could be a possible characteristic polynomial. And you wouldn't know whether the Frobenius went to the identity element or to a unipotent element. So Deligne's theorem is, uh, is proved by a consideration, I guess, Edixhoven gave a proof of, of for, for not just mod p representations, but for p-adic representations. It's proved by a consideration of l-adic or p-adic cohomology of the modular curves and of p-adic etal sheaves on them. And uh, I was going to wave my hands at this, but I'm, I don't know how much I'm going to be able to wave my hands successfully. Let me just, uh, let me just say a word about the proof, and I'll, I'll send you to the literature for the... Uh, for the details, which are formidable. So the proof goes like this, or a sketch, without doing too much. But you'll at least see where it comes from. The first thing is you prove rather easily that your eigenform f, which has weight k, can be written as some theta to the a a g with a g of weight less than or equal to p plus 1. Namely, uh, this derivation, once you apply it to all the forms of weight uh, less than or equal to p plus 1, you can hit all the eigenforms. <clears throat> so this allows, and if this is the case, and you're able to construct the representation associated to g, then you get the representation associated to f with this property, then uh, uh, if can construct rho g, the representation associated to this other form of smaller weight, then you find that rho f is just the tensor product of rho g with the Teichmuller character of the Galois group to the eighth power, where I've used this symbol now 47 times. But it, with this case, it means it's the homomorphism from the Galois group of q bar over q to the automorphisms of mu p, which is z mod p star. That's a one-dimensional representation in characteristic p. Namely, applying the theta operator just changes the Galois representation by twisting by a power of the Teichmuller character. That's just from the Fourier expansion. You see that immediately. So, in this sense, since the, in this sense it, it, it reduces you to a construction of the representations rho g for small weight. Uh, and if k is equal to 1, if uh, g has weight 1, you can replace it by the form AG, multiply it by the Haas invariant of weight P. With the same Fourier expansion, and since this Galois representation only depends on the Fourier expansion, I mean, it's determined by these ALs and epsilon Ls, et cetera, uh, it suffices, if you want to construct it for this thing, it would be enough to do it for this thing of weight P. And consequently, you're reduced to construction of rho F for weights 2 less than or equal to k, less than or equal to p plus 1. And in that case, you can actually say quite, quite concretely where the representation comes from, which I'm now going to try to do. Mm -hmm. I give up. Down. Up. No. Stop. Stop. Up. There we go. OK, then it turns out that for weight for k equal 2, you use the Eichler-Shimura relations that <laughs> Yap talked about, which I won't have time to do, to actually construct rho f inside the p torsion of the modular curve j1 of n over q bar. If you take, sorry, j1 of n is the Jacobian of the curve x1 of n, classifies its unramified covers. 
if you take its, it's an abelian variety, you take its p-torsion, that's not necessarily defined over q, it's defined over q bar. This gives a representation of the Galois group over q on a large z mod p vector space, and you find that your desired representation occurs as a submodule of that, once you tensor with e. And for a 3 less than or equal to k less than or equal to p plus 1, a trick of Sayers allows you to construct rho f inside the p torsion, not of j1 of n, but of j1 of n times p. n is prime to p, always, remember. So this is, this is just one power of p dividing the level. Bar. And this is a very delicate procedure. It requires lifting to characteristic 0, et cetera. And I'll just refer you to look at some of the papers I use for a reference to do it, because I have now about 10 minutes left, and I actually want to say what Sayre's conjecture was. OK. Now, here's Sayre's conjecture. It's the other way. Here's this magnificent procedure using the Jacobians of modular curves to construct Gawa representations. And uh, we know something about those representations, how the unramified primes act. We'll see a little bit more that we know how the inertia groups act at the ramified primes. And Sayre's conjecture says that this is the only way we know how to produce these Galois representations. Perhaps this is all of them. So Sayre's conjecture is as follows. You start with a representation. And I'm going to assume it's absolutely irreducible. So I won't do the, I won't do the case uh, of direct sum of two lines. Galois representation pro from the Galois group of Q to GL2E, where E is a finite extension of the field of P elements. So <clears throat> the most interesting case, of course, is where this map is surjective, where you're just really finding a number field, which is a Galois extension of the rational numbers, where the Galois group is isomorphic to GL2 of E. So these are, in some sense, the most simple non-abelian extensions you could find to the rational numbers, because GL2 contains the group SL2, and those are the first examples of uh, non-abelian simple groups. <clears throat> so we assume it's absolutely irreducible. We assume one other thing, namely, for what is the action of complex conjugation? So inside of this group, there's a canonical conjugacy class of order 2, complex conjugation, and that's mapped to a conjugacy class of order 2 in GL2 of E. Now, at least when the characteristic is not 2, there are three different conjugacy classes of order 2 in GL2 of E. You could have the identity matrix, which has order 1. You could have minus the identity matrix. Or you could have a matrix which has one plus eigenvalue and one minus eigenvalue. And you assume that you go to the third. So you assume, assume when P is not equal to 2, that rho of complex conjugation, which I'll denote by Frobenius and infinity, is conjugate to a matrix that looks like a plus 1 and a minus 1. So it has 1 plus 1 eigenvalue, 1 minus 1. So it's not the identity, and it's not minus the identity. When p is equal to 2, you assume nothing. So in characteristic 2, there are a lot of different elements of order 2. You can take Frobenius to any of them. It's amazing. OK. Now, if you have such a representation, you get its determinant, which is a one-dimensional representation. And we know a lot about one-dimensional representations of the Galois group of q from the work of Dirichlet and class field theory. And you can write that, you can write this as a character epsilon, where the conductor is prime to p, conductor prime to p, times a power of the Teichmuller character to the k minus first power, uh, where this has got conductor p. It, it can't be wild at p. This is the point. You pull off the tame part of the, the determinant at p. That's a power of the Teichmuller character. You're left with something unramified at p. And k here is only determined mod p minus 1. So starting with such a representation, you get a character of order prime to p with values in E and a power of the Teichmuller character. And the conjecture is that such representations come from modular forms mod p. So now let me state that carefully. So Deline gives such a construction. 
So the conjecture is <clears throat> then there exists a normalized eigenform f <coughs> of weight K. Uh, let me call this, sorry, I'm going to call that thing up there kappa. Sorry. I'm not, I can't reach it. But that K has now been declared to be kappa. I don't want to deal with the boards anymore. There's a normalized form of weight K on gamma 1 of n with coefficients in E such that and character epsilon such that rho is equal to rho f. As, as Galois representations, they're isomorphic, where f is constructed via the lean and the cohomology of the modular curves. So that's the very crude conjecture of Serres. So I, I don't know how to... That's, all, that's the hardest part of the conjecture. No one's been able to touch that. Some, some results of when uh, E has two elements and E has three elements, a little bit when E has five elements, and that's it. Uh, but what Sayre did, which is a much nicer, you see, this is, a, this is also uh, the sort of conjecture like all elliptic curves are modular, which is also completely unfalsifiable. It's one of those safe conjectures that people like to make nowadays because you have no way of running through all modular forms of weight K on all gamma 1 of n and testing it, right? Each, a lot of different weights, you have a lot of different levels. So to make it falsifiable, what Sayre did was he specified what the weight and the level should be. Uh, in terms of the Galois representation, or at least what a minimal weight and what a minimal level should be. Moreover, and this is the fine conjecture, <coughs> the minimal level n is the Artin conductor, and I'll say what that is, of rho away from p. So you, it's determined by the restriction of rho to the inertia groups at all primes not equal to p. <coughs> the, uh, and the minimal weight satisfies, first of all, k congruent to this kappa, that's the kappa up there, mod p minus 1. It better, because in Deline's case, you'll see the determinant is epsilon. So the determinant of rho f, I should have said that, is epsilon times omega to the k minus 1. So k better be congruent to kappa mod p minus 1. It also lies in the interval between k 1 and p squared minus 1. That doesn't determine it, of course. And it's determined by the, the restriction of the representation to a ramification, to inertia group at p. Determined by restriction of rho to an inertia group at p. Which, and I'll give you the recipe, or something of it. See how much time I have. Almost no time. Okay, so what I'll do is when I start off my next lecture, tomorrow on Rivet's theorem, I'll tell you what the minimal level is, what the Artin conductor is, and I'll give you the recipe for, for working out the weight. So this is rather amazing. You, you start with just a, 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 a raw representation with this condition at infinity. You define an integer n greater than or equal to 1 from the inertia group's action of inertia at all primes L not equal to P. You define a weight from the action of the inertia group at P. These are all local Galois representations. And then that puts you in a finite dimensional vector space, the modular forms of weight K for gamma 1 of n. And the claim is that there's an eigenform in that space whose eigenvalues tell you what the characteristic polynomials of are for Frobenius elements at unramified primes. So pulling back enormously from this, this detailed conjecture, what you're doing is you're starting off with a Galois representation. You're using its local properties, in particular its local ramification properties, to define a finite dimensional vector space over the field of P elements namely mk on gamma 1 of n, with a lot of commuting endomorphisms, namely the Heck operators. And from the eigenvalues of those commuting endomorphisms, you're predicting what are 
the characteristic polynomials of Frobenius elements at unramified primes. That's the structure of Sayre's conjecture. And in that structure, I think it probably can be generalized to many more groups beyond uh, GL2. Uh, but uh, this is a much richer structure than that because there's a lot of structure involved in the space of modular forms mod P. Now, let me just say what is known about this because that will lead into my next talk. Uh, as I say, the, this part of the statement, the crude statement, the existence of an eigenform, as I say, nothing is known. So there it's known if, if the cardinality of E is equal to 2 or 3, and a little bit is known for 5. But you know, once you get to fields of 7 or even the field of 9 elements, nothing is known. So that, that's the main conjecture, the existence of some modular form somewhere in the world which gives this Galois representation. However, if you assume that you have a modular form somewhere, so you start off with a representation of Deline's type constructed from some modular form of level n, okay, and you go compute the Sayre invariance depending on the ramification of the minimal level and the minimal weight, you might get a different minimal level or minimal weight than what you started off with. So Sayre's conjecture says there has to be another modular form of that weight and level that gives this representation. So that would be the, like the refined conjecture. And a lot of progress has been made on that. The main contribution I'll talk about uh, next time uh, is due to Ribbit. And there are other, there's other work of Cariol and Adixhoven. Uh, Many people have worked on showing that if something is modular somewhere, then it's modular of the correct level and weight. And I think the status now is, although I don't really understand this too well, that if you assume that the field E uh, has odd cardinality, so you're not in characteristic 2, and you prove that the thing is modular somewhere, then it follows from all the work of these people that it's modular of Sayre's minimal level and minimal weight. So, but th this is still the, the huge mystery. Uh, that uh, sort of looms in front of us. So I'm sorry I have to cover so much so quickly. I, I said to the organizers you could do a conference on this. You could also equally well do a conference on Ribbit's theorem, which will be my next talk, which will probably be even more of a Zoom. But uh, so I hope something has been comprehensible. Thanks. I, I said to the